Hello, my name is Jay Ocampo. Welcome to Module 5, Lesson 3 of our Cisco Encore video series about the wireless LAN security features. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the different authentication methods used in wireless LAN networking covering PSK, EAP, and web authentication. Security is a main concern in modern networks. Security is particularly important in wireless LANs, in which the radio signal can spread beyond the edge of the building and the security of its physical premises. An attacker outside the enterprise perimeter might be able to hear a valid client signal and even associate to a corporate AP. When the wired equivalent privacy or web standard was found to be weak and easily breakable, both the Electrical and Electronics Engineers or IEEE 802.11 Committee and the Wi-Fi Alliance worked to replace it. Two generations of solutions emerged. First is the Wi-Fi Protected Access or WPA and its successor which is WPA2. These solutions offer a security framework for authentication and encryption. As you will see in the illustration, we have two types. The first one is WPA2 authentication method, and the second one is the web authentication method. Under WPA2 authentication, we have a WPA2 personal mode. It uses WPA2 PSK or pre-shared key authentication. In here, a common key is statically configured on the client and the AP. WPA2 personal mode is designed for environments where there is no radius authentication server. It provides inadequate security for an enterprise wireless network. If attackers break the WPA2 PSK, then they can access all device data. The second mode is WPA2 Enterprise Mode. It uses IEEE 802.1x and EAP authentication. Here, each user or device is individually authenticated. It incorporates a radius authentication server for authentication and key management. WPA2 Enterprise Mode is used by enterprise class networks. Guest authentication introduces some unique challenges to wireless security. Guests have come to expect internet access at most locations, whether it is LAN or wireless LAN, to check emails or connect securely to their own office. However, having guests use the corporate LAN or wireless LAN to obtain internet access would compromise the security of the enterprise. Traditionally, guests have just used a separate service set ID or SSID and a dedicated VLAN for PAT isolation. But the one-size-fits-all approach does not meet the requirements for flexible and secure guest access. Here, web authentication solves the guest access dilemma. So what is web authentication? It authenticates a guest in a way that provides for security but does not create undue support overhead. It can be used for devices that cannot perform or pass the 802.1x credentials. WebAuth can be used as a backup means of authenticating employee devices that fail 802.1x authentication but you still want to provide some level of access to these devices. Some devices such as printers or cameras do not support any authentication that requires user interaction to provide authentication. These devices can use MAC authentication bypass or MAB. MAB enables port-based access control using the MAC address of the endpoint. Some consumer chip manufacturers have attempted to bypass weak password choices by adding a method to automatically generate and distribute strong keys by using a software or a hardware interface with an external method of adding a new Wi-Fi adapter or appliance to the network. These methods include pushing a button and entering a short challenge phrase through the software. The Wi-Fi Alliance has standardized these methods in a program that is called Wi-Fi Protected Setup or WPS, which is formally called the Wi-Fi Simple Config, but this program is not part of WPA2. 
current security recommendations suggest that this program should be avoided and turned off if present because there are many known weaknesses and attacks against it. A key element of authentication is making sure that the credentials that the client sends can be read only by the authenticating device and are sent to the correct authenticating device. These credentials are typically encrypted before being sent. Pre-shared key or PSK authentication uses symmetric encryption, meaning that the same algorithm and key that are used to encrypt the credentials are used in reverse to decrypt the message. With PSK, a common password is configured on both sides. Symmetric key encoding is relatively simple. However, it is not recommended for strong user authentication because it is not very resistant to a key attack. One issue with PSK authentication is that if the password is saved on the wireless client, the process does not authenticate the person who makes the connection, but rather the device. The same authentication process occurs whether the device is being used by a valid user or by an attacker. For this reason, storing personal passwords on laptop or desktop computers is considered dangerous. Unless authentication requires the user to enter credentials, then the device, not the user, is being authenticated. Whether the infrastructure authenticates a device or its user, the process occurs when a connection to the network is made. The authentication process begins at either an AP or wireless controller at layer 2, or authentication can also occur deeper in the network, in which case layer 3 is used to communicate between the end device and the authentication server. So how does PSK work? An 802.11 compliant wireless LAN client will use open authentication by default. Open authentication uses no keys. Open authentication operates at layer 1 and layer 2 and it does not offer end-to-end -end security. With open authentication, the client device has only authenticated itself as an 802.11 capable device. There is no encryption per packet authentication or message integrity check. Additional security measures should be added such as IEEE 802.1x. Shared key authentication is initially like an open authentication. The difference is that a key is required on the client and on the AP. By using this, the authentication process adds a challenge and a response between the AP and the client. The PSK client authentication and association process are as follows. Number one, the client sends an authentication request to the AP. Next is that the AP sends a clear text challenge phrase to the client. Then the client encrypts the phrase with the shared key and sends it to the AP. Number four, if the AP can decrypt the phrase with a key, then the AP sends an authentication to the client. Next is the, once authenticated, the client makes an association request. Next is the AP sends an association response. Then next is a virtual port is open and the client data is now allowed. At this point, data is encrypted using the same key. Now let's talk about EAP. So what is EAP? The 802.1x architecture neither contains protocol specifics for wireless clients to send their credential to the authentication server nor specifies how this authentication should occur. Dial-up ISPs had the same issue with the dialing authentication issues of CHAP or PAP over PPP uh, for clients. To solve this problem, the IETF designed the EAP or Extensible Authentication Protocol. EAP is a general protocol for authentication that also supports multiple authentication methods such as token cards, Kerberos, one-time password cert certificates, public key authentication, and smart cards. EAP does not specify which type of authentication to use. It simply defines the authentication steps and headers. EAP separates the authentication itself from the authentication process. As such, you can use EAP with almost any type of authentication and several layers of consecutive authentications can occur within the same EAP framework. Be aware that EAP defines four message types such as request, response, success, and failure. Any side in the authentication process can start, 
although the AP or WLC usually starts the process by sending an identity request message. Because of this flexibility, several mechanisms are defined to allow client authentication. Some of these mechanisms authenticate the client, some authenticate both the server and the client. Other mechanisms authenticate the device, the user, or both. Depending on the level of security that is needed, you can implement the chosen mechanism as long as it supports EAP. Be aware that there are approximately like 40 different types of EAP. Some of the most common types of EAP include EAP TLS, a PEEP or PEAP, EAP FAST, EAP SIM for GSM, and EAP AKA for UMTS. Now let's talk about the authentication server. The authentication server functionality in the EAP process can be provided by the following. First is locally by a Cisco wireless LAN controller, uh, which is referred to as local EAP. Local EAP can use either the local user database or an LDAP database to authenticate users. Local EAP can also be used as a backup for radius authentication. This approach allows wireless clients to authenticate even if controller loses connectivity to the radio server. Now, globally, we can use the radio server such as Cisco Identity Service Engine or ICE, Microsoft server that is configured for Radius NPS, or any Radius compliant server. As I've said earlier, right, there are multiple types of EAP. The three current most commonly used are EAP TLS, PEEP, and EAP FAST. PEEP is currently the most prominently used as it is used with Microsoft servers. However, EAP TLS is gaining in popularity as it can be supported by Cisco ICE. The following conclusions can be drawn based on the discussion of EAP. First one is EAP TLS. While very secure, EAP TLS requires client certificates to be installed on each Wi-Fi workstation. This approach requires a PKI infrastructure with extra administrative expertise and time in addition maintaining the wireless LAN itself. Next is PEEP or PEAP. The Protected Extensible Authentication Protocol or PEEP is secure and requires only server-side certificates. Therefore, you can use a more manageable PKI or no PKI at all. Cisco and Microsoft support PAP and it is available at no additional cost from Microsoft. The third type is EAP Fast. EAP Fast is a secure solution for enterprises that cannot enforce a strong password policy and do not want to deploy certificates for authentication. Next is uh, EAP TTLS. EAP TTLS addresses the certificate issue by tunneling TLS and thus eliminating the need for a certificate on the client side. This approach is often the preferred option. EAP TTLS is a proprietary standard and originally developed by Funk Software but now owned by Juniper Networks. Juniper primarily promotes TTLS and there is a charge for supplicant and authentication server software. And the last one is LEAP or LEAP. LEAP has the longest history and while previously Cisco proprietary, Cisco has licensed LEAP to other vendors. A strong password policy should be enforced when LEAP is used for authentication to prevent dictionary attacks. For this reason, LEAP is not a recommended form of EAP in the enterprise. So what is EAP TLS once again? EAP TLS is one method of applying digital certificates. To use EAP TLS, a certificate, which is a public and a private key, must be generated and installed on both the authentication server and the client. Modern systems commonly use a two-level of authentication. The client certificate is used first, allowing the client machine to be authenticated to receive encrypted data from the authentication server. The authentication server also sends its certificate. The user is then authenticated by using another method such as a password. The certificates that are previously exchanged between machines are used to protect the user credentials while they are transmitted. 
When the user identity is confirmed, the user pair of keys is encrypted with the client machine public key and sent to the authentication server. This pair will be deleted at the end of the session. At the beginning of the authentication process, EAPTLS uses the 802.1x authentication framework. Therefore, to allow end-to-end -end EAP, the wireless LAN portion uses open authentication up to the association phase. The client sends a start frame to the AP to show that it uses 802.1x and EAP. The authenticator returns a request identity message to the client. The client sends its identity, user, or machine name. Then, the authentication server then sends its certificate, which proves its identity and provides the client with the means of sending back encrypted frames. The client then answers with its own certificate. Now let's talk about PEEP or PEAP. PIP can be seen as a compromise between EAPTLS, which relies entirely on a certificate-based infrastructure, and the EAPFAST, which does not require any certificate exchange between the client and the authentication server. With PIP, a certificate is required but only on the server side. The client machine simply needs to support PIP. The philosophy behind PEEP is to pretend to perform a TLS exchange to first create a tunnel in which the real authentication will occur. The secured tunnel is effectively created in this uh, first phase, but the client does not need to have or send a certificate. However, for an outside eavesdropper, the exchange occurs as if certificates were exchanged. Now let's talk about EAP fast. EAPFAST provides a way to ensure that as much security as EAPTLS but without the need to manage certificates on the client or server side. To achieve adequate security in EAPFAST, the same authentication server on which authentication occurs also generates a unique shared credential that is used to mutually authenticate client and server called Protected Access Credential or PAC. EAP FAST has the three phases. The first one is phase zero, it's, which is about pack creation. The pack needs to be installed on the client. It can be done manually or via a trusted connection where the client is authenticated using another method, like for example, a certificate-based TLS or password-based MSCHAP v2. The next is phase one, or which is a pack exchange. Here, the AAA server and the end user or client use PAC to authenticate each other and establish a secure tunnel. A process similar to TLS is used to verify the identity of the AAA server and to establish a secure tunnel between the client and the AAA server. PAC replaces the digital certificate that is used in EAPTLS and eliminates the need for a PKI to manage the certificates. The third phase is phase two, which is about authentication. Here, the radius server authenticates the user credentials with another EAP, which is protected by the tunnel that is created in phase one. Now let's talk about web authentication. So one of the challenges in a wireless environment is providing guest access, right? Guests must be able to easily access the wireless network, yet they must not compromise the security of the corporate network. Another factor is balancing security with the admi administrative ease. WebAuth is a process which allows users, typically guests, to authenticate to the network through a web portal via a browser interface. Clients that attempt to access the wireless LAN using HTTP are automatically redirected to a login page where they are prompted for their credentials. Their credentials are then passed to an authentication server, which then assigns the appropriate VLAN and ACLs for guest access to the internet. There are three basic areas that must be defined for web authentication. First is from where the guest path isolation is defined in network, which is about the local WLC and auto anchor. Next is from where the web portal pages are provisioned like the local pages on the WLC or the remote pages on an external web server. And third is from where users are defined. So here we are talking about the local guest user account on a WLC 
and this, or the centralized guest user account on a Radius authentication server. Now let's talk about the different types of web authentication. And the first one is about local web authentication. Local web authentication is designed for small businesses that need to provide lo local guest access. The VLAN that is used will be defined in the switch and routed to the internet via the router and firewall at the network edge. With local web authentication, a WLC provides the following. It maps an SSID to a dedicated VLAN to provide path isolation, and it typically uses open authentication. It provisions basic web authentication splash pages for the web portal. It maintains local user guest accounts like username and password with an SSID that is allowed for the account and the lifetime for the account. Here, the WLC has a default web login page that can be used for guest authentication. You can use the default page as is or make some minor modifications such as hiding the Cisco logo, creating your own headline for the login page, and redirecting the user to another URL via HTTP after login. You can also download a customized web authentication login page to the WLC. The customized page may have additional elements such as an acceptable use policy or AUP that must be confirmed with the guest user login. A lobby ambassador management account can be created for WLC to offload guest access provisioning from the IT staff. This account is a management user account with the specific role of creating, deleting, and extending the use of guest accounts. All right, so the next type is local web authentication with auto anchor. Some customers prefer to have all guest traffic on a single network, but the dedicated guest VLAN and dedicated port concepts do not scale well across the enterprise. These issues can be addressed by guest anchors. Auto anchor mobility, or also called as guest tunneling, is a feature of mobility to restrict a wireless LAN to a single subnet, regardless of a client entry point into the network. The characteristics of an auto anchor operation are as follows. The guest associates to the local controller and the local session is created. After that, a session via a tunnel is created to the auto anchor WLC. Next is that the packets from the client are encapsulated and sent through the tunnel to the auto anchor WLC. Then the auto anchor WLC then encapsulates the client packets and delivers them to the wired network. Then the last step is that the traffic from the wired network to the client goes through the same tunnel. The auto anchor operation effectively isolates the guest traffic through a tunnel to the auto anchor where wired traffic is routed at the DMZ. The local WLC provides the following. It tunnels client traffic to the auto anchor while the anchor WLC provides path isolation. The anchor WLC provides the following. It provisions basic web authentication splash pages for the web portal and it also maintains local user guest accounts. Now, rather than having the web auth process be handled exclusively by the local WLC, the authentication portion can be separated and handled by an external authentication server while the local WLC handles the provisioning of the web login pages. This model works with just the local WLC and authentication server. However, an auto anchor WLC can optionally be used for path isolation. Here are the characteristics of local web authentication with external authentication operation. First, a guest associates to a local controller and the local session is created. Then the guest receives web login pages from the local WLC. The guest enters credentials that are forwarded to the authentication server, which could be Cisco Eyes for authentication. Then the authentication server returns the confirmation, assuming that the credentials are valid. And lastly, the guest traffic is routed to the internet and the WLC provides path isolation. The addition of the anchor WLC would better isolate the guest network traffic. And the last type is decentralized web authentication. 
With a centralized web authentication, the tasks of provisioning web login pages and maintaining the guest user accounts are no longer done on WLCs, but instead are done by a centralized server such as Cisco ICE. Cisco ICE is more than just a radio server. Cisco ICE allows you to provide highly secure network access to users and devices. It helps you gain visibility into what is happening into your network, such as who is connected, which applications are installed and running, and much more. It also shares vital contextual data such as user and device identities, threats, and vulnerabilities with integrated solutions from Cisco technology partners so you can identify, contain, and remediate uh, threats faster. Here are the characteristics of a centralized web authentication operation. A guest associates to a local controller and the local session is created. Then the guest is redirected to Cisco ICE. Cisco ICE provides web portal pages and guest authentication. And after that, guest traffic is routed to the internet. As depicted in the figure, the auto anchor WLC can optionally be used for better path isolation. In this lesson, you learned about the different authentication methods such as WAPA2 and web authentication modes. We also describe how PSK works and how insecure this type of authentication is. We also covered some implementation of EEP such as EEP TLS, PEEP, and EEP FAST. We also spoke about the different methods in the web authentication such as local web authentication, local web authentication with auto anchor. We also covered the local web portal with external authentication and a centralized web authentication using Cisco ICE. Thank you very much for watching the video.